so this is basically the first unit of um, more substantial content that we would like to share with you at this conference. And as it is a keynote, um, it continues this theme of setting the tone for the conference. So yeah, it's more concrete, um, but it's still uh, also a bit high level, so to speak. And uh, what we would like to do uh, in about the next hour with you is to take you on a journey together with uh, our favorite mascot, Volpi, whom you all know by now, I think. And uh, yeah, Volpi is going to pack his bags and go on a journey to see how we all got here uh, throughout history. So how have we worked with information historically? How can we contextualize the work with Transcribus uh, within history? And then also, uh, after we have looked at how Transcribus itself contributes to this journey, uh, so the, those are basically the sites that we're going to see. So the things that you can do in terms of information extraction with Transcribus. We're also going to take a look uh, into the future of um, how we work with information as humans. So the keynote uh, is entitled Unlocking Historical Value, Information Extraction with Transcribus. And yeah, will be delivered by Michael Ustashevsky, our head of R&D, and yours truly. So packing our bags, let's get a few things straight. It's always good to start with some definitions that we all know what we're talking about, that we're on the same page, basically, to use a historical documents metaphor. Information, memory, and culture, what role um, do they play for transcribus and for how we have been dealing with information throughout history? What is information anyway? I've already said a few words about it. It's when we structure things, when we put them together in a meaningful way, but they also have a somewhat mechanical component, or we can define them in a pretty sharp way, uh, but maybe also one that's general enough to be useful for all the different use cases uh, that we're coming from. Information, whoops, I exited full screen. Um, I don't know, what, do I need to, it's not going back to the, just a second. Now it's back. So um, yeah, information is uh, things that are distinguishable. Look at these two pictures. Which one do you think contains more information? I would say it's the one on the left. So it has more complexity. Uh, it has more meaning than the one on the left where we have two identical instances of this coin, which is a historical coin, uh, by the way, uh, around 600 uh, BC from Ephesus uh, in the Roman Empire, nowadays Turkey. Uh, so things that we can distinguish between, I think that's a very general but useful definition for uh, yeah, talking about information. Memory, that's another important uh, concept because many of you are part of memory institutions, museums, archives, libraries, parts of universities are also devoted to memory. So remembering stuff. Take a look at this picture and uh, try to use your memory. And in a couple of seconds, um, yeah, uh, we're going to do a little experiment. Everyone ready? So now the image is gone. And now let's see who can remember how many objects were in this image. So I'm not asking what the, there's always one. <laughs> yeah, uh, great. Great memory and uh, great uh, capacity for taking a, uh, taking a look at things uh, in a very general way. 
and a general purpose way, which is very important also for historians, by the way. So being able to take a step back and look at things from different angles and not just the, the angle that we're used to. What I wanted to show is basically that uh, it's very important what we're focusing on when we extract information and when we try to remember stuff. So yeah, here again, for those who want to count, if you didn't believe me, it's exactly 14. <laughs> well done. Um, so memory has a cultural component. So it depends on what the lens is through which we're looking at history and how we're extracting information from data. There's always bias in there, bias that we need to reduce and keep to a minimum, which is not easy. Uh, and especially culture is something, yeah, that uh, tries to, to do its best to prevent us from seeing things objectively. If there is such a thing as objectivity, which is uh, not a given, at least in uh, the humanities. So the host ended this meeting, it says here. And the clicker isn't working anymore. <laughs> so let's see if we can fix this like this. Yeah. So what is culture? Another little experiment. What color is each tractor? Who wants to answer? What, what are these two colors? Anyone? How about Mr. 14? <laughs> no? I think most of us here would probably say blue and red. But that's... Sorry? I, I didn't quite get it. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You mean special like uh, color technology that farmers use? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's simpler than that. Uh, the thing is that not in all cultures, those would be as clear cut as blue and red. In Russian, for example, there are several different words from blue that are used a lot and not uh, words like light blue, uh, dark blue, that are derived from each other, so that have a certain logic, but words that are completely different. For example, uh, galuboy and sinye. So those are, so the color scale in Russian, uh, yeah, is divided in two, basically. And you have two sort of larger groups of uh, how you would call a certain shade of blue. And this here uh, on the left, the, the right one I just uh, uh, produced myself, just recolored it. The left one uh, is called Cine Tractor. This is a very uh, beloved children's show on YouTube that is about a yeah, dark blue tractor. And as you can see, many of us would, probably wouldn't call it dark blue, which is the closest translation of Cine because it's very close to this line, but Russians are very good at distinguishing uh, between such uh, very close lying shades of blue. So it depends very much on how we're trained, how we're brought up and yeah, what uh, the goggles are uh, on our faces that we're using to look at uh, history and information. Uh, yeah, and to now to define those three terms, information, stored distinguishables, basically, stuff that we put somewhere and that has meaning because we can distinguish between the various elements of them. Memory, that's how we store and retrieve it, which as you've seen, uh, has a strong cultural component. And in the end, culture, which is exactly that component that determines how we look at things and that we also need to try to keep to a minimum as uh, scholars. So yeah, let's take a quick look at uh, what this all means uh, and how this, uh, yeah, how we have been dealing with information throughout history. So the first part of the journey, and you can see me as a bit of your tour guide, uh, is the sequence of information ages. So I tried to um, make a small typology of, uh, yeah, the basically major um, eras throughout history where things changed in a major way regarding to how we deal with information. First, uh, the zeroth age, 
basically. So stepping back before we're even going to discuss the first age, the age of biological memory. So we are, uh, at least according to modern science, animals. And uh, before we, yeah, gained the things that we now they use to distinguish ourselves uh, from the other animals, uh, yeah, we were pretty close and pretty similar to them. So how we remembered stuff and how we stored stuff was basically the same as your dog or cat, cat does it in your biological brain. We access this memory through our senses and thought already. So thought um, can also happen without uh, higher functions as they are often called in biology. And uh, the rules, yeah, were also determined by thought. So if we thought something was dangerous or not, yeah, that happened all inside our brains. When was this going on? Until about 600 to 200,000 years ago. Um, yeah, historians, linguists, biologists aren't quite sure, um, often fighting about it a little bit. Uh, but we have a, a number of things that we can use to uh, make this guesstimate. Uh, what we do know is that we share uh, one of the most important things uh, that determined what came next with uh, our mm, yeah, cousins that aren't around anymore, and if, unfortunately, the Neanderthals, we share a biological trait. So the next big thing which came around, language, must have evolved sometime before we and the Neanderthals split, at least from a biological per, uh, perspective. Uh, yeah, and this takes us to the first age uh, of information, the age of, of language. We still were using our brain mainly. Uh, senses and thought were still used for access. But language developed and the rules, the cultural sort of rule set uh, was determined by this new fancy tool. And along with it, art as well. If we uh, look at cave paintings, uh, for example, uh, these make uh, higher brain functions necessary. And this happened after the point that I mentioned before. So after 600 to 200,000 years ago until about 8,000 years ago. And the main thing that changed was our biology. We developed this insanely complicated and fine tunable and fine tuned vocal track that we all have in our throats and faces uh, and that we use uh, our lungs for uh, to basically play bagpipe in a very fancy way. Uh, yeah, and also the genes were obviously important for that as I explained and we shared those with the Neanderthals so they were probably able to speak in a way that was quite similar to ours. What happened next? Once we had figured out language, the next thing that we figured out was how to put language outside of our bodies. And permanently, we invented writing. And the new thing that we now had was graphical signs with which we could store this linguistic information outside of our bodies. We accessed those signs through reading and writing, writing systems, genres, catalogs, indices. So basically everything that we later used for thousands of years was now possible. And this started around 8,000 years ago. So this uh, Jiahu script uh, was generally, or is generally accepted as one of the first instances of human writing. Next thing, um, once we were able to put written uh, linguist, linguistic information and abstract thought outside of our bodies was to process this outside of our bodies as well, because a written page isn't able to process information. It's just information that's there. Uh, and this started roughly in the early 17th century. Um, in a good tradition, the Germans and the French are fighting over who actually invented this who invented the first calculating machines. The Germans say it was them because the first schematic that you can see here uh, was made by a German, Wilhelm Schickert. The French say, no, it was us because we actually built it first. So yeah, 
the uh, age-old fight between uh, idea and implementation. Once we had that figured out, we went back a step and enabled the machines to process information in the way that we usually communicate information with other humans. So we learned to teach the computers to understand us again. So that's something that they couldn't do yet. Uh, yeah, and to talk in them in a basically non-formal or formalistic way. And the first major event here that we can quote uh, is the development of baseball, a question answering system, which was developed as early as the 1960s that was able to answer questions about baseball. So pretty narrowed down field, but still, yeah, very powerful for its time. And so, yeah, that's basically how we got here. We had different ages where we learned more and more things uh, that were useful for processing information. And now let's take a look at how we process information that comes from histori historical documents. And I'm giving the floor to you, Mikhail, for the next chapters. Yeah, um, we aim to structure data, which means we want to extract information from data. And on the surface, we are dealing with transcripts, with text. And Transcribus has many features that allow us analyzing text to get from raw data to information. Um, one of the core features that enables us to achieve this task has been included in Transcribus from the early days, namely the uh, manual tagging of entities or whatever spans of text you would like to annotate in the editor. And uh, in addition, you can also provide um, entity linking features, for example, by adding Wikidata IDs to individual entities that you previously manually annotated in the text. But once there is manually annotated data or ground truth, in other words, you can try to train machine learning models. And that's why we have recently started working on automatic tagging uh, components, which are not yet implemented in Transcribus, um, but it's, as you will hear later in the next uh, uh, lecture on our roadmap. And we have been already developing uh, automatic entities, entity tagging components within the framework of managed projects. So we work with it. It's not there yet for the uh, community. And when I hear people talking about text tagging, they often refer to named entity recognition. This is one of the most prominent use cases, but we are actually working on a generalization of named entity recognition. We want to provide um, yeah, trainable models that can deal with um, arbitrary user-defined tag sets, not only with names, place names, um, organization names or dates, which is the typical tag set in named entity recognition, um, and the way to achieve this is, for example, by means of supervised models that are being fine-tuned uh, based on uh, pre-trained language models like BERT, for example. Um, I have provided here a few examples of automatic text tagging um, from a project that we are working on with the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, uh, which they are also members of the cooperative. And together we are working on a workflow for the transcription and uh, entity extraction of insect specimen labels. This is a very specific uh, tag set that is needed for those labels. We have, for example, on the first label, um, a name of an insect species followed by the um, symbol denominating the sex, the biological sex of the animal plus um, the name of the researcher, the biologist uh, who uh, described the species. Um, we, have see, we can also see the transcripts generated uh, for um, those label cards and the tags highlighted by colors. And with those um, yeah, um, structured tags, we can actually extract this information, put it, for example, into a spreadsheet or ingest it into a database. So this is one of the major steps that is necessary from going from raw data to structured information. Um, another component that is essential um, is entity linking, 
we are also working on automatic approaches to assign um, yeah, unique identifiers from external knowledge bases to entities recognized within spans of text. Um, what you can see here are, again, a few of those insect specimen labels. On the first uh, label on the top left, um, the entity Formosa has been identified by the entity tagger. And um, by looking up the respective uh, concept um, or entity in the geonames or Wikidata database, um, the tagger um, came up with the unique identifier of this entity. And this is very interesting because uh, Formosa is nowadays uh, Taiwan. So irrespective of the wording of the name used for an entity, you can still relate two mentions of text to the same concept in the real world. Um, another example is here in the second and the third label. We have um, two types, uh, two names, two and mentions, I'm sorry, of the same insect species, the Tripoxylon fronticorne. In the second, uh, in the third example, only fronticorne is mentioned, but still the knowledgeable researcher knows that those two mentions refer to the same species, which can be identified with this cryptic code in the catalog of life. So what we see here are examples of data normalization. Irrespective of the surface form of the entity, they refer to the same concept. And now things are getting really interesting because you can take the step from information to knowledge by linking concepts to databases with, which have curated expert knowledge to describe entities um, and their characteristics in the real world. Here you can see, uh, for example, a screenshot from the catalog of life where you can see not only the scientific name of the species, Tripoxylon fronticorne, but also its taxonomic rank and um, its uh, geographic distribution. So with this information, for example, you can make more in-depth analysis, you can interpret data, and most importantly, thanks to those unique identifiers, you make your data interoperable. You can connect it with other collections. Then, uh, apart from textual analysis. Yeah, I just wanted to take over for a minute again as uh, the tour guide, uh, because I actually put the quotes there. Sorry for missing the first one. Uh, but I think that in the beginning was the word. We all know that that was from the Bible. That was basically the introduction to what we can do with text in terms of information extraction. And uh, the, the next site that I wanted to introduce uh, and to let our local expert uh, show. So you can basically pick, picture me as the tour guide on the bus and Michael as uh, the local who, are going, who is going to show you the pyramids of Giza. Uh, and the next chapter here is visual analysis because uh, after picking apart text, uh, another thing uh, that we can do aside from that is taking a look at the document and just gauging um, by the way it is structured visually, uh, what pieces of information are stored inside of that document. And uh, the quote, I think, is uh, a really good description uh, of what we are trying to achieve with the new components that we're providing here, because the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And so new ways of looking at the documents is what we're trying uh, to provide, uh, among other things, with visual analysis. Back to you. Yeah, in order to understand how historical or uh, modern documents can be visually analyzed, we need a, a brief refresher of uh, some major concepts in computer vision from the field of object detection. Um, the task of semantic segmentation, which is illustrated on this slide, consists in determining for each pixel in the image uh, to which class um, the pixel belongs. And in one image, there can be multiple classes. Like in this image, for example, there is the class of uh, beach, shore, uh, I mean, shore, sea, sky, and persons. And um, each individual instance of a person is assigned uh, a specific ID denominating the person class. So you cannot identify individual instances of persons. You just know where all elements belonging to the person class can be located in this uh, matrix of pixels, which is an image. 
Instance segmentation takes a slightly different approach or uh, yeah, addresses a different challenge. In instance segmentation, the goal is to identify individual objects of one particular class. For example, here in this image, we ignore all background. Background is any pixel that is not a person. And within the person class, we try to identify individual instances, persons. Then there is also panoptic segmentation, which is basically a combination of the two previous uh, tasks. Panoptic segmentation tries to identify um, classes, uh, pixel classes in an image, plus in addition uh, to assign unique IDs to all instances of a particular class. So for example, here we again have um, the shore, the sea, the sky class. And within the person class, we see there are three individuals. So we basically merge panoptic and instance, um, I'm sorry, instance and um, semantic segmentation. And uh, what it has to do with transcribers can be explained easily. Um, we have the field model now, the field models now integrated in the beta platform, and they both support, they support both panoptic and instance segmentation. Um, an example of a page processed with uh, field models can be seen here. Uh, we see the raw image and uh, now um, the overlay of uh, three different fields, one identifying the name of a person in this index card, one identifying the place, probably the birthplace and the year of birth. So these structures, this cloud of pixels by highlighting areas that have some semantic feature in common. Those field models are also trainable, which is a major, yeah, um, major um, yeah, feature of the whole platform that you can adapt your um, models to your materials, to your specific tasks. And with those trainable capabilities, um, new ways of um, processing documents arise. Um, here is an example of segmenting the layout of newspapers um, by identifying heading fields versus paragraph fields versus separators. Uh, so if you as a researcher are interested only, for example, in the headings for a quick analysis, then this uh, tool helps you to pick those elements that are really relevant for your analysis. Um, you can use field models to identify particular pieces of information in such complexly structured documents as um, this form or an index. Again, this is a quite complex tag set. There are around 15 different fields, all of which have a separate meaning. And um, yeah, the trainable component allows you to um, apply those um, structures to an arbitrary large collection. Field models can be also used to handle a particularly difficult layout type multi-column documents. Without field models, probably um, standard baseline detection would just draw one line across the whole page, which of course is um, useless for many uh, types of analysis. And with field models, you can first separate um, the layout into individual columns and then run baseline detection with each in column. Thus preventing the model from merging undesiredly baselines. Um, taking field models one step further, we now have also made available table models. Table models allow us to deal with um, complex, highly condensed information in tabular structures by overlaying a grid over the image to highlight the rows and the columns. Table models are also trainable. And uh, how does the training and recognition work? Well, basically it's a two-step field recognition. In a first step, individual rows of a, of a table are identified. And in another step, the columns of a table are identified. And by intersecting the rows and the columns model, you can come up, come up with a grid that can be put over um, the tabular structure. And the great feature or the great characteristic of these table models is that you do not necessarily need visual separators like horizontal or vertical lines, uh, but just some uh, gaps, um, space between the 
text items can already serve for the model as, the, as a clue to separate columns and rows from each other. Um, yeah, here we see a grid uh, that is fairly straightforward, but there can be even more complex table layouts, for example, multi-line rows where each row or each record consists of one to many rows of individual text. And yeah, um, with the help of this procedure, you can structure your document neatly into table and columns. Another use case for field models um, is the labeling of um, very specific idiosyncratic particular types of content. In this example, we see um, yeah, music note sheets where uh, the field model was capable of um, detecting the um, area of image containing the musical notation, another field for the textual part, and another field for uh, any illustrations or initials. Yeah, so everybody back on the bus. Hope we didn't lose anyone along the way. Uh, yeah, one next component uh, that is one of the sites on our tour today is large language models. Uh, and here I have found another very beautiful quote. The art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge. And that's exactly what we can do uh, with large language models. We can ask them questions about our documents, basically. And it's about uh, yeah, how we talk to them. Uh, yeah, this determines how well they work. So prompt engineering plays an important role here. And let's take a look at uh, yeah what we've been up to in terms of lang large language models and what our ideas around them are regarding transcribers. When I showed you the slides uh, that demonstrated automatic text tagging, um, I demonstrated the use case of uh, supervised um, yeah information extraction. But large language models, um, as they have become prominent with OpenAI's uh, developments and so on, um, allow us to um, extract information from documents without training data. So just by leveraging the linguistic and word knowledge contained in those um, large and heavily trained models. Um, one, um, the, the chart here highlights um, a workflow that we experimented with. We um, made experiments to um, use particularly designed prompts um, together with some input texts that were fed to uh, ChatGPT. And, and the aim was to extract um, structured information by annotating um, the documents in question with um, yeah, the named entity or um, entity classes that we were interested in. And yeah, the most important part of this uh, chart is actually that there is no training data contained in those symbols. So um, it's really um, promising to work with documents without having the necessity of creating uh, ground truth. Um, we made experiments with two types of uh, entity schema definitions. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, we made experiments with a user-defined entity schema where the user tells the large language model which type of entities he or she would like to extract. So you could just prompt the model to extract name, location, or date, for example, but you could also use more complex schemas that you first need to define to the large language model. And what we can see here is an example, again, from the MFN insect specimen labels. So um, yeah, for example, Xenulus atratus was uh, correctly uh, uh, tagged as um, specimen. Um, and yeah, the, um, the collector of the specimen Blutgen leg, for example, was also correctly identified. In the open-ended schema, however, that is shown on the right-hand side, um, the user does not provide explicit definitions of each entity category, but asks the model, the large language model, to infer autonomously what kind of entities are contained in the collection based on a sample corpus fed into the model. And the results were quite astonishing. For example, the Psenulus atratus was uh, identified by the, by the model as species, so it is exactly what we were interested in. 
there are some deviations from the uh, user-defined schema. For example, in the um, second line, Blutgen leg was split up into two tags, uh, person and the collector uh, suffix leg. Um, which makes perfect sense. It was just uh, the user-defined schema that wanted both words uh, to be tagged within one span. So it's basically a viable approach if you want to explore your collection, if you want to get a basic understanding of what is contained in a set of documents. Um, the example below shows a slightly more straightforward application. Uh, we made some benchmarking tests on the Hype 2020 data set, historical um, newspaper entity processing shared task data set uh, that contains named entity uh, markup. And the model was also capable of understand or extracting quite robustly those entities. Um, we compared the supervised uh, tagging approach, the unsupervised one. And um, on a very high level, we found the following uh, insights. Um, supervised models um, basically achieved best accuracy in terms of precision recall and F1 scores on entity extraction. Um, and unsupervised models, well, it's hard to tell whether they are much better, that whether they are worse or are much worse. Um, in some cases, they achieved almost similar performance as the supervised models. In some setups, we achieved um, yeah, far worse results with unsupervised models. So the lesson to be learned here is whether accuracy can be uh, achieved as high as with supervised models depends really on the collection in question, the tag set that you would like to extract, and most importantly, the models. So GPT-4, for example, performed much better than GPT-3.5 and so on. Um, both types, supervised and unsupervised um, entity extraction uh, is very useful for um, information extraction. So when your goal is only to uh, come up with a structured, um, for example, spreadsheet that mentions all entities within, within a text without highlighting the exact span, the exact location of a given entity in a text. When this is the use case you're interested in, so um, um, annotation within a transcript, then the unsupervised approach might be um, not the best choice. Supervised approaches tend to perform better here according to our experiments. But the last column highlights the benefit of large language model unsupervised information extraction. You don't need training data. You just provide a few examples, uh, a few definitions of categories, and you get more or less good results. Um, what we have observed uh, is that models, the large language models, sometimes tend to hallucinate. We all know this phenomenon. They tend to um, have a behavior that is difficult to control for us as developers or prompt engineers. And that's the reason why, um, yeah, annotation uh, where the exact position of a tag within a span of text is important, didn't work that well. So we, for example, we saw that the models um, tended to over normalize um, historical texts by modernizing the input, which makes the approach not so useful for annotation. Um, but we had some, we have some ideas how we could mitigate those um, yeah, dif difficult to control stochastic behavior of large language models. Our idea would be to combine the best of two worlds. We could use a large language model for the production of ground truth. Um, and this hypothesis ground truth, let's call it that way, generated by a large language model could be then reviewed by an expert um, on the domain. Um, and this reviewed, um, yeah, entity extractions could be then used to train a supervised lightweight model, for example, a small uh, bird model for entity extraction. And if the use case is just um, getting an extract rather than a, a position exec transcript, you could basically also consider going directly from the large language model output to a spreadsheet format, to a structured format. Yeah, okay. So I hope everyone liked this site. We're getting back on the bus again, picking everybody up again. 
and are moving to uh, the next stop, which is multimodal approaches to information extraction. And here again, uh, this favorite quote of mine, when you need to innovate, you need collaboration. And collaboration in this case means collaboration between uh, machine components. So it's not just about collaborating as humans, but also putting the right machine approaches together. And this is basically what multimodal uh, approaches are about, where you combine uh, algorithms that can, that can do different things well to achieve the best overall result. Back to you, Michael. Yeah, um, basically we made some um, development tasks, uh, development and experiments in the hybrid connection of um, textual and visual information. Textual information gathered from transcripts and applying entity recognition, visual information gathered from layout segmentation and field models, for example. Um, in this particular example, um, we applied first table recognition. And up on top of the table recognition, we applied entity extraction with a custom trained model. Um, the goal here is to identify in those columns um, where the patient's, where the doctor's name is, um, and also to detect where um, yeah, the cause of death, for example, is located. So particularly tricky is the third column where cause of death and name of the doctor is mixed. In an ideal table, this would be separate columns, but this is not often, it's sometimes not the case in historical documents. So we trained a model uh, that was able to um, encode the position of a word within the table. So it's row and it's column. Um, and to detect within those individual cells, which string uh, yeah, denominated um, the doctor, the patient, the cause of death, for example. So this is an interesting case because usually um, entity recognition models require context, which is not really present in this table. So we um, included the context by the positional information within the table. Um, another use case of hybrid uh, connection of visual and layout information is um, X classification rather than entity recognition applied on top of layout segmentation. So first we apply here a field model to detect the paragraphs of a newspaper layout. And then a text classification model can be used to categorize the semantic content of each uh, paragraph. For example, the first paragraph, that's a made up example, could be labeled as economy. The second paragraph is culture. So a model that only deals, that only processes visual features would be hardly able to make this fine-grained semantic distinction. So you really need to get into the content to uh, analyze its semantics. Um, but those examples that you have seen before are kind of a workaround. We combined uh, our tools that we already have for visual processing and our tools that we are developing for textual processing. But um, the future probably lies in approaches that merge both words. So in multimodal approaches that really genuinely try to um, jointly learn within one single model, the visual and the textual features of documents. Um, on the left hand side of this slide, you can see like the workflow that we apply currently. We have an image, we segment its layout, we run HDR on this document uh, within this layout structures, and then we can try to extract entities uh, from the transcript. And the important part of this left hand side workflow is that the entity extraction only has access to the transcript. So any layout information, any typographic information, whether we are dealing with bold or italic font, whether the uh, whether the, where the position of a given word on the page is, all this is neglected by the model. Um, multimodal approaches, however, they are able of uh, focusing both on the text and the position, typography, layout, and so on of individual words on the page to come up with a more robust, with a more informed representation of entities. And uh, multimodal approaches even open up, um, up avenues to, yeah, to end-to-end -end processing where no individual layout 
recognition and no individual text recognition component would be required, but that can come up directly from an image to um, the extracted list of entities. All these new possibilities of technology um, should also force us to rethink um, how we currently do things. For example, how we are used to represent documents um, in transcribers. Let me explain you um, this with two examples. Um, we have seen an increasing number of projects or problems that actually um, are interested in processing not individual pages, but entire documents. So here we would need to go from a page to a document and figure out how to correctly represent it in a robust way. In this example, we have two pages, um, the text uh, region on the bottom of the first page is continued on the top in the first region of the second page. And yeah, uh, with those new, especially multimodal approaches, we could actually learn that those two text regions across two different pages are related to each other, but we need to think clearly about how to represent this properly um, in our data schema. One simple idea would be, for example, to add a continued is true tag in the text region markup of the page XML file uh, for the second page. But is this really the best approach? That's an open question. And I think we have a nice opportunity with this conference to discuss such issues. Another rethinking um, is whether we should find new ways of interaction between users and documents and how information is presented to users. We are talking in this uh, lecture about information extraction. And when you're interested in getting a structured extract from a document, you often do not really care about um, any word that is not to be put into a spreadsheet column. Uh, however, a transcript verbatim transcribes every single letter, every single character. Um, on the page. So maybe a better representation for information extraction would be a table that shows you in columns all entities of a given class that have been detected on the page. But actually, if you really want to, for example, correct or verify the results of an automatic procedure, you also would need some link between an extracted entity in a tabular, tabular structure and its position in the image. So maybe we should rethink ways of representing data if we are to include more information extraction features in the future. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so um, we are reaching the end uh, of this little trip that we have been taking together. And um, yeah, once uh, yeah you have gone on a trip, on, on a trip, uh, you often get hungry for more, thinking uh, of the future and where you're headed next. And uh, this is exactly what we're going to do uh, for the next couple of moments, because uh, the story of the ages of uh, dealing with information uh, isn't over yet. So we have reached a chapter in this story, but uh, there's more to come, obviously. And uh, yeah, things are really heating up at the moment. We are uh, at an incredibly uh, exciting juncture uh, in the history of processing information. And one of the next big things uh, that everybody's talking about is uh, a cultural singularity. And uh, this would mark the beginning of the transhuman age of information processing. And yeah, this uh, would change uh, things again. For example, the technology of how we store uh, things is changing. So new forms of just the actual medium where we put information to use it later on is changing. So the biology uh, is coming back here as well. Uh, we are basically putting together machine components or what we traditionally consider to be machines with biological uh, components, which enables us to access this information again with our senses and sensors as well, and thought. So 
the whole paradigm of how we access stored information will change drastically. Uh, the, the rules of how we do this, uh, they're also coming back to this uh, thought pattern. So culture, we don't know what role it's going to play because if we access information directly in our brains or in machines that are connected to our brains or located inside our brains, what effect uh, are the rule sets and uh, the cultural components going to have? If you think of what's, ha what's happened with social media alone, so all of that is still outside of our bodies, what's going to happen when those things enter our bodies? How are we going to process information once culture sort of yeah, determines how we think? Um, yeah, when is this going to happen? probably soon. Uh, and what will be the major changes here? One thing is true machine autonomy, and we are already pretty close to that. Uh, the first step is here to outsource the decision-making process to machines as well, not just um, providing a basis for decisions. Um, there's a very good practical example, uh, autonomous uh, driving, so self-driving cars. So far, Machine learning algorithms have provided the basis uh, for the decisions that classical rule-based algorithms take later on. So they provide, for example, um, traffic signs. The machine learning algorithm identifies a traffic sign and the classic algorithm decides, okay, when I see this traffic sign, then I need to stop. Uh, the, the stage that we're entering now is that we're also outsourcing this decision-making process to a machine learning algorithm. And if you consider that machine learning algorithms or AI algorithms are not as reliable uh, as most uh, classic algorithms, then that op opens up a lot of questions, I think. Um, so true machine autonomy, then machine knowledge. I said connecting things. Uh, and uh, really doing things in the real world. That's what's not what knowledge is all about. So putting the information together and doing something with it, creating something new from it. That's something that machines are also increasingly learning to do. For now, it's probably more, um, yeah, that they are good at pretending uh, to do this, but in the future, they will be much better at doing the actual thing and the merging of humans and machines uh, that I already alluded to uh, will also be a very big topic here. And uh, the question is, uh, I've put two scenarios here, which one is more likely, or if they're going to happen one after the other. To go back again to history, a lot of humanity scholars here, uh, are we going to see a Pygmalion scenario where we basically create our own playmate who's as intelligent or even more, in, more intelligent as ourselves? Or is it more Harari's homo deus scenario where we merge with the machines ourselves and sort of become gods? This, uh, I think, are very exciting thoughts, maybe a bit scary thoughts, but I think they concern us all. And... Uh, we're going to try to keep it real, as they say with Transcribus, and uh, yeah, do the next logical things, which is extract information uh, and putting it to good use together um, before everything explodes. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little trip and we have a couple of minutes for questions. So if you would like to know any more details about what we have shown you on our little journey today or have any input, then please speak up. I'm going around with the mic, so I'm giving you the mic. In the meantime, there's one question for Michael, maybe. What software are we using for NER? And then that was now online. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe let's um, just wait. So the question was what software we are using for named entity recognition. Um, the implementation that we have currently developed is basically um, um, a wrapper around the Transformers library from Hugging Face, where we can download um, pre-trained models. 
in the examples that we have worked on so far, we used um, the distilled uh, bird model, the multilingual one, because we were dealing with fairly modern varieties of uh, language, so quite modern um, German and English. So we didn't have the need to um, train um, or domain adapt the, the models to historical language variants. So yeah, um, transformer-based hugging face implementation. So, yeah. so if I may, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask about the tables. What about if the information is written not, not correctly in the field? You know, it starts in one field and then it goes like to the other field. You know, something very typical for many older tables that they are not very well confined. Um, yeah, I mean, um, this is indeed a frequent case and um, we can also try to capture this with uh, help of baseline models, for example, that you can train um, on top of uh, field of the table model to learn this. Um, yeah, but I think uh, the multimodeler in the first step, the hybrid approaches that we've shown could also provide highly useful for this because um, you're doing the same as a human. You uh, realize, okay, this word doesn't belong uh, in that cell. So when you also process semantic information along with the structural information, then that could provide the necessary clues to put stuff in the right column, basically. So this is something yeah, that we may work on in the future, I think. Anyone else? There's a question. Uh, hi, or, okay. uh, Matteo. Okay. Thanks for the trip. Um, I have a methodological question. Uh, in one of the last panel, uh, you showed that the um, now the process of transcribus goes from the image and then to the fields, then to the text, and then to the final result. The next step is merging the two passage in the middle in uh, one single process, and the future is that. Uh, uh, clockwork uh, icon that you uh, put on, on screen. This is uh, some kind of uh, uh, omnicomprehensible uh, step that makes all at once. Uh, now, I was thinking about Interpares project of Luciana Duranti in, uh, in the Canada University that is uh, uh, addressing the topic of losing, losing control on what the AI do, does to uh, records. So I was thinking, the, this is final step, uh, maybe um, strongly recommended for our purposes, but uh, doesn't put us at risk of losing control of what Transcribus does to other records. Um, I mean, this scenario that we pointed out uh, is a potential avenue. It doesn't mean that uh, we necessarily need to go there but um, it could make workflow much easier. Um, workflows because you do not have to uh, train those individual models, but actually what I think would be the most um, meaningful approach here is to um, select, to give uh, users the choice which mode of modeling information they would like to use for their particular use case. So it doesn't mean that if those uh, end-to-end -end multimodal approaches work well, we would replace everything else. Um, this would be just an additional um, possibility for particular use cases where the user should decide whether this is useful or not. And, and one uh, other thing, um, Günther already uh, stressed it in his presentation or his introduction, uh, we still need uh, to use our brains, so reviewing what the model output actually is, that's where the experts come in. So they need to be able to uh, tell them if a model performs well and how reliable the, the output is. And I think the main thing here is uh, that uh, you have to consider uh, how much more you can do with those models, even at the expense of a little bit of quality, what you can do quantitatively changes what you can do qualitatively because you can get out information uh, from your documents that you couldn't have done in a, a hundred years. Putting a hundred people to work on 
a certain collection for 100 years, you couldn't have extracted as much information uh, as you can with, uh, yeah, nowadays technology. And the question is how much quality or precision do you want to sacrifice for one thing? And the other thing is how reliable were the humans in the first place? That's also a good question, I think, because uh, especially in the historical uh, disciplines, uh, if you read um, secondary literature and you quote it, then you're relying on basically, yeah, an algorithm as well that happened to be running in someone's head and not in on a server farm, basically. So I think uh, there are a lot of angles here. And uh, the, the most important thing is, yeah, look at all the fancy things that we can do, but be responsible about it. More questions? For Steven, then you, then we need to. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering whether, uh, as you bring up, you know, the need for kind of human supervision, interaction, uh, uh, you know, checking of these outputs, whether there is a kind of crucial user interface component to the whole cycle and ecosystem that you're imagining, where as the quantity and complexity of what is able to be produced by these models increases, we need increasingly powerful and adaptable kind of review tools that can take us quickly through uh, and, and identify uh, or help us to interactively kind of focus on the critical points that need to be checked by humans. So uh, I wonder if that kind of UI is, is part of the plan. Very good point. And uh, that's something that we're actually uh, already working on. So quality control, that's one thing that's essential. Uh, and especially uh, when it comes to training AI models, um, there are more and more uh, studies surfacing uh, that boil down to basically uh, garbage in, garbage out. And this is especially true for AI models. So this is something that we may lose sight of a little bit with all the fancy things that LLMs, for example, are able to do. They provide or they produce very plausible looking output. But uh, if the input isn't good, then the actual plausibility can be quite low and the output of the model can be bad. So uh, being able to produce very good ground truth, that's something that we're focusing on strongly, which will then later make the output better just uh, by that virtue. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, sampling in general is uh, something, uh, yeah, that's very important to us at the moment. So uh, building better sampling tools for humans to review both output and uh, ground truth as well. So quality is one of the main strategic topics uh, on a, yeah, for the cooperative this year as well. So we're very, uh, uh, aware of this problem, and we are actually building components that should help with this. Hi, uh, I was thinking about your near experiments, uh, where you compared supervised to unsupervised methods. Have you evaluated the historical aspect, like uh, unsupervised methods uh, worsening uh, when you go back in time? Uh, could you please repeat the last part of the question? Yeah, like when you go back in time, for instance, uh, an, an LLM not domain adapted to historical text will probably pre perform worse. And mm, we, the only experiments we have done so far is with this historical newspaper collection, which uh, spans from the late 18th century to the mid 20th century. And we have seen that, uh, I mean, the biggest problem for us in this experiment was that, um, yes, yeah, I mentioned briefly, the model tended to modernize old variants um, of spelling, for example. Um, it also mod uh, corrected um, OCR errors, which was kind of desirable. 
um, but um, altogether the language variant it was not that different from present day English. So um, okay. for more historic, for older variants, we have made no experiments so far. But um, yeah, but yeah, that's an interesting case, definitely. And if you have any experiences, we would be glad to to hear about your uh, opinions on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But uh, yeah, historical variants of languages do play a role. And um, we have some anecdotal evidence. For example, we've been working with Latin a little bit. Uh, and there are different um, variants of Latin throughout history. And it's, yeah, you can see that performance suffers when the model hasn't seen much of a certain variant. Um, yeah, so this comes down to fine tuning, basically, the model. Okay, maybe one more question and then maybe a little break. Should do. Is there anyone? Hi, thanks for that. I wondered if you wanted to say anything about how we were, we were thinking about environmental costs of the more compute that we're doing. I know we've got a plan for that, but we might want to share that given we're talking about more compute. Um, yeah, there are uh, actually different approaches that we're taking here. Uh, one is we're uh, trying to uh, get hardware that's as efficient as possible because there is quite a large uh, margin of variation there, how uh, efficient a GPU can run models. So this can be in the double digits uh, percent region, basically. So 20, 30, even 40% uh, of a difference, even of same generation models is possible. Uh, and the other thing is we are thinking uh, of um, also working with uh, workflow management a lot to string things together in the right way. So basically, uh, as uh, Michael has already shown, for example, using a large language model for uh, creating ground truth, high quality ground truth pretty quickly, um, because the large language model is very uh, good at uh, figuring out things, but it takes a lot of compute power. And then using the ground truth that you have produced with this smaller quantity of material with a more lightweight model. Uh, and this is both uh, a good thing ecologically and uh, for the users as well, because with the lightweight model, you can process things a lot faster. And this is both true for uh, yeah, language models uh, and uh, handwritten text recognition, for example. So combining lightweights and heavyweights in the right way is a very good approach here. And maybe if I might add a third point, and um, that is responsible usage. So we've seen that there were a lot of trainings that made maybe not too much sense. So we're also in the yeah, process of developing tools where you can see how much is my training actually doing because hitting a button also means that there's 500 hamsters running in your wheels. So uh, we need to be aware of that actually costs something and that energy is consumed in, in that sense. So a responsible usage of that is also yeah important. And we're also working on that. So because I, eventually it's us that's hitting those buttons, but those buttons have an effect and yeah. Yeah, we're also working. 